Hello. Uh, the title of um, what I'm talking about today, or at least what I've got written down, is some additional thoughts on authority. Um, this grew out of a conversation that I had with uh, two uh, young men of God and, and got me thinking and, and exploring my own uh, thoughts about authority and why there's a problem with authority. Um, and that question of authority, which or what authority can we trust, by what authority do we make the statement of truth? Again, that discussion is not something new, and um, it's vast. I mean, we could, we could go on and on about it. Um, and so it's really, I want to focus in on Christian authority. What, by what authority uh, does the gospel speak, or does Christianity speak? And so in our discussion, I tried to show, uh, or at least open up for your thoughts and reflections, um, that there's a certain tension today, particularly in the Western world, about the nature of authority. And the question centers around objective authority, that which is measurable and verifiable. It's, a, it's a, and, the, and it's external to the self. And the issue of subjective authority, with that which is inside of me, what I think and what I feel, or actually subjective in terms of what the group thinks. Um, that can be both objective and subjective. And I also attempted to address a little bit the place of science in the quest for truth. I'm not a scientist, and there's some really good stuff on uh, the authority of science. But it's my opinion that science has a, a valuable role to play <coughs> Excuse me. that's not in conflict with Christianity. And that science and faith uh, can work together and are, in fact, together. Um, but I hold that science is limited in this uh, question of authority or in the search for truth by the boundary of being objective and measurable and verifiable. In other words, it has uh, within it, within science, um, the, uh, the experimental method that must be followed Exactly. It's, it's uh, limited to the laws of math, of physics. Uh, it can't go beyond that. The science um, is not to be subjective. In the West uh, today, I mean, we see this in the, in the pandemic. And uh, the confusion that a lot of Americans have and Western Europeans have about uh, wearing masks, not wearing masks, take the vaccine, not take the vaccine. Um, and the difficulty there is that many of the scientists uh, have become political. They've become, and it's become subjective. In other words, what do I feel? What do I think? What's my opinion? What's my choice? And the reason for that is the evidence um, is, I believe, clear, but keeps getting questionable or extended or um, presented with lack of clarity because it's become political. Um, if science becomes subjective, even what's even more dangerous is that it can lead to things like eugenics, uh, genetic en engineering, um, and abortion are all based in, in this um, subjective, it's my body, it's my choice, for example, with abortion, which is also being used uh, by people who are against uh, the vaccine. So anyways, uh, and then in this discussion, I, uh, I rambled on a lot. I hope you enjoyed the ramblings. Uh, but I did so just to give you a sense of how big the discussion is. It, but it's, it's a discussion that has to take place, and particularly within the church leadership as it seeks to evangelize, and especially in the West, uh, where uh, science and um, Christianity oftentimes get in conflict. Um, and it's really, I think, important uh, discussion, which I'm not sure we're, we're, we can cover at length in this, but just introduce um, as it seeks to understand the real presence of God in worship and in daily life. In other words, what does it mean when we say, uh, God is with us. So I want to start uh, in this uh, little uh, podcast, I guess they call it, uh, with what the evangelical church 
uh, calls the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 28, beginning in um, verse 19. Uh, now, I know, as I begin to talk with you, this assumes the authority of Scripture. And uh, that, in other words, the Bible itself, particularly the New Testament, has authority. And maybe sometimes we can do, do a podcast on the authority of Scripture and how it gets its authority. Um, and I know that there are what's called exegetical issues. In other words, what is the text saying? What's the context of the, t- of the text? Uh, there's even the authenticity of the account of the text itself. But I'm going to ignore all of that uh, because I want to illustrate more how the Christian community understands authority, uh, not whether the text itself is authoritative. In other words, someone wrote down, uh, or claimed to be Matthew, uh, that this, Matthew 28, this was a authentic story about Jesus and comments that he was to make uh, to his disciples about the mission he wanted to send them on. And the community of Christians uh, for at least 1,600 years accepted this, uh, even today, as an authority. This is, this is something that should be believed and, some, more importantly, something that should be acted upon. But I think in order to understand the, uh, the issue of authority, which is, our, which is our topic, is you have to start with verse 16 to get the full impact and the power of what Matthew is telling us about the Great Commission or the Christian mission. Now it starts, now the 11 uh, disciples, so the 11 minus Judas, went to Galilee and to the mountain, and hold on to that word mountain or underline it if you underline your Bibles, to which Jesus had directed them. Now, we're not sure what mountain this is, but the fact that it's on a mountain is spiritually significant in all monotheistic religions. Uh, Spiritual things happen on mountains. Uh, And if you've ever been to the mountains, you can uh, almost just going and looking as a spiritual experience. I remember I was in Denver, Colorado back in 19, I think, 79. And... uh, was not feeling well. I went to my hotel room, and my room, uh, by the grace of God, overlooked the Rocky Mountains. And a thunderstorm began to happen over the mountains. It's my first really uh, time ever experiencing the mountains, even going through the mountains. And this storm went on and on and on. And um, it was a spiritual experience. I, I sensed in every part of my being the incredible majesty of God. So spiritual things happen on mountains, um, but in particular, there are places where the voice of God is spoken to a man. Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, where he receives the Ten Commandments. Uh, In fact, the whole Exodus is based on going to the mountain in order to worship God. Of course, there's Jesus on the mountain, which is Mount Tabor and the Transfiguration. There's uh, Jesus with Elijah and Moses and the voice of the Lord speaks. This is my son. And that moment, that transfiguration is so significant uh, uh, in understanding the passion, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. And even in uh, Islam, Muhammad, who first first received his revelation in a cave called Hira, uh, located on the mountain Jabai near Mecca. Uh, or excuse me, Jabai on Nur near Mecca. Um, So there's this mountain, and so here they are, I believe, again on Mount Tabor, only this time, rather than being Peter, James, and John, it's the 11. And he's gathered them to this spot, and he's gathered so that, um, let me suggest, they will hear the voice of the Lord. Not just a suggestion, but they're going to have a meeting with the Lord. And so they're under orders. Jesus has set up the meeting. They're going under his direction to meet him. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. 
He has yet to be ascended into heaven. And they're meeting in Galilee where it all began, home for most of them. And the place, place of beginning, the place where they saw and lived out the mission of Jesus to the people of Galilee, the poor, where uh, uh, the sick were healed, the lame walked, uh, the deaf heard, but also the place in Matthew of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, um, the, the teaching of Jesus. Matthew is a teaching, really, a lot of emphasis on the teachings of Jesus. In fact, some scholars suggest that the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is broken into five parts and in modeling the five books of Moses. And now it goes on, if you read, it says, And when they saw him, Jesus, they worshipped him. Let's we'll say that again. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now that's so important, that phrase that they worshipped, because you can only worship God. In other words, what Matthew's saying is there's some of the disciples have come to recognize and identify that Jesus is the human God. He's God, and so they worship him. But it adds, some doubted. We don't know who doubted, but there are obviously some that have not come to this understanding of who Jesus is. So with all the objective data of his resurrection, Whereas this is a post-resurrection scene, and they're on the mountain. With all the data that they've encountered, there still are some of the disciples of the 11 that are still doubting. Now, obviously, what they're not doubting is that he's resurrected from the dead or they wouldn't be there. So uh, that, that uh, he's among us. What they're still haven't dealt with is who Jesus is. And let me again suggest, and these are all suggestions for you to go, that they really don't understand. None of them really totally, completely understand uh, God with us until Pentecost, until the coming of the Holy Spirit. Those who did not doubt, who worshipped him, the, the difference is that they have, like Peter, had the subjective revelation by the Holy Spirit that Jesus is a human God. That has been revealed to them, made known to them. Uh, Peter had a taste of this experience in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, when Jesus asks the question to the disciples, who do men say that I am? And then finally turns to Peter and says, who do you say that I am? And, and uh, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said something very interesting. He said, uh, you didn't figure this out. Basically, God revealed it to you, made it known to you. In other words, you have this subjective experience of truth that is given to you from an outside source. So they believe, the, the ones that are worshiping, believe that they have this revelation that he is God, like Thomas in the upper room. Uh, the words, uh, uh, when he's finally, Jesus invites him to touch his wounds. He turns and worships and says, my Lord and my God. Uh, that's a great phrase, and it's uh, something that I was taught to say during the Eucharist when the priest uh, lifts up the bread uh, to say under my breath, uh, my Lord and my God. Uh, the same way when the chalice is lifted up, the cup, uh, to say again, my Lord and my God, that I'm worshiping at that point, uh, Jesus among us. I'm not worshiping the bread and the wine, but I'm worshiping that I believe the bread and the wine is this is my body and this is my blood. Because it's only God who's to be worshiped. Now, Matthew's Gospel is written so that you and I might discover who Jesus is and come to know that, uh, to follow him, to become his disciples, but most importantly, to worship him, to worship him on the mountain. Each one of us to come to that moment. 
to join with all heaven and earth, with angels and archangels, with prophets and patriarchs, the entire communion of saints, and the whole heavenly host to worship him who alone is worthy to be worshipped. Again, in the, in the Eucharist, in a liturgical church, in, in my tradition, it's called, what the, it's called the Sursum Corda, when uh, this exchange between whoever's presiding with, uh, and with the people, the Lord be with you, with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Uh, and, and finally ending in this, uh, him saying, therefore, it you know, is worthy to praise him, it's worthy to worship him, and therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we join and worship. Worship is going on in heaven, <clears throat> and we join them. They, they don't join us. We enter into that by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an extremely charismatic moment. And so here in this worship, Jesus is now going to speak. He's now going to speak the Great Commission, which should be the mission statement of every church. That mission, in light of who Jesus is, because his authority is speaking it. So Jesus came in the midst of this worship and said to them, those who are worshiping and some doubting, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now at this point, most people, preachers, teachers, jump right to what the Great Commission is. And glory to God, it's a Great Commission. And then they talk about how we should do it, which is okay, and, and at times has to be spoken. But for our purposes, in this little podcast, I'm only looking at the issue of authority. So what is our authority to do what we do? What is the authority of the church? What is the authority of the Christian to do whatever it is they're going to do? This authority coming out of worship comes out of the person of Jesus, who is God. Our authority is a person. All authority has been given to him. Jesus, who has all authority, and by the way, is the truth, is going to delegate that authority that's been given to him in heaven and on earth, to his disciples to do what? To go forth into all the world and do mission. The authority of Jesus is given to the church. What is the authority of the church? It's that which has been given to it by Jesus. It's not something that it claims on its own. And one must have that authority, even if they are a doubter in some areas, in order to do the work of the Father in the world, to do the work of love, to do the work of the cross. What authority does the church have again? It is the authority that has been given to it by the person of Jesus. This morning I read this um, really great short reflection by a dear friend, Father Kenneth Tanner. He's a great pastor, and um, he's even better, as great a pastor as is, he's even better on his thoughts on the Incarnation. He has one of the best grasp on the reality of the human God of almost anybody I've spoken to. And he wrote on Facebook several years ago, I think, this, this quote. Let me read it to you. When the Word became flesh and moved in our cities and seaside villages, it was the painted eyes of the adulterer who beheld him and the tainted hands of the tax collector who in invitation took his hand. It was the ears of the doubter ravaged by existential darkness and the hate-tortured heart of the persecutors, grown-up temple-attending and law-abiding bullies who first heard his voice. And what they saw and what they touched and what they heard was the love that created them and a love that desired them above all of all else, a fire of love that would remake their clay into vessels of living water who, when poured out together, become a river that waters all nations, 
and then to lanterns who radiate the uncreated light of a kingdom that will never end. Wow, that's so it's a powerful word. I've often wondered why this is true. Why was it the broken, uh, the wounded, the hurting, who, when they looked into the eyes of Jesus, heard it? Why is it that some, however, when they looked into the eyes of Jesus or felt his touch or heard his words, did not understand. In other words, why did some encounter the love of God in the flesh that Father Cantor talks about and, and, uh, and realize that they were looking into the eyes of God who is more loving than, than just loving? He is love. Why is it that some today um, hear the message of Jesus and almost instantly come to a life-transforming moment and are radically new, while others hear the message as silly or stupid or, or worse, dangerous. Why is it that we find so many, particularly in the Western church, who say they will love Jesus, but in fact they've created a Jesus in their own minds or image and reject the Jesus of the cross, reject the Jesus of the gospel, or the Jesus that has been, been presented alive and real in the ancient and historic church. I am moved by the words of um, my friend, Father Kenneth, and uh, my inclination is to agree wholeheartedly, rather, uh, that the majority of those who really heard him, who saw him, who followed him, were among the poor and simple Agarian folks of Israel. And that's true today, that the gospel is on fire in areas of the world where poverty is rampant and disease is rampant, who are the simple people. That's the record. It's the record of history. There were some, however, Pharisees and religious who did embrace him. Uh, I think Joseph of Arimathea. And it records in Acts that there were Pharisees found among the early church. But even among the poor and the broken, there was not universal acceptance of Jesus. Never has been. If you remember, the poor of Nazareth, his hometown, wanted to throw him over a cliff. The crowds who encountered his love and healing and deliverance, uh, who were fed miraculously with fish and bread, turned and walked away from Jesus when he tried to explain to them the real presence of God in bread and wine, that that's where you would find his life-giving love, rejecting not only his words, but rejecting him. See, we can talk about the rejection by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and try to identify ourselves with the poor, the blind, the demon-possessed, who embrace his love. But within each of us, I believe, within each of us is that, that struggle. Um, there's a person there um, in the subjective realm who can easily and most likely will at times, like Peter, look Jesus in the eyes and maybe not see him, but even seeing him will reject him, his words, and sadly, but most importantly, his love, forgiveness, and mercy. Thank God that Jesus opens the path like he did with Peter to come back, inviting us always to come back, always to repent, always to experience the great joy of confession that I have sinned by my own fault, and to hear the words, you're forgiven. See, it's a tough thing to embrace, um, but we will find looking into his eyes and hearing his call, and perhaps rejecting, but then being restored. Why is it that we who need at our core to be loved in order to love, reject the one who is love, the source of our humanity and our eternity. It always comes back that for the Christian and for the church, 
or even for the scriptures themselves, that all authority is in the person of Jesus, crucified, risen, and ascended to the throne. It's his authority. Remember when he taught, and the crowds will ask, who is this that teaches with such authority? What is this authority that's all totally different from all the authorities of all the other religions in the world? What is this authority of this person, Jesus? Even the creeds of Christianity don't have authority except that they're about him. What is it? As Christians, whatever we look to for authority, whether it's scripture, tradition, a magisterium, apostolic succession, creeds, or even martyrdom, come back to the person of Christ Jesus, who is then now and forever. This was, in fact, the mission of the early church. Not only to evangelize, but to define and clarify and reveal the person of Jesus. The 400 years of um, creedal debates and controversies are all around the person of Jesus. To come to a conclusion, who is this person? What does it mean to be a Christian has to do with who the person of Jesus is. I believe with the early fathers who were in this discussion from the earliest, earliest days understood that if they, hence we, get Jesus wrong, that everything else is wrong. Reaching a culture or baptizing a nation, um, to use the scriptural world, means to preach and teach, and most importantly, to live out a relationship with Jesus that is both objective, in other words, he really did exist, and that's important, but is more importantly subjective, a subjective truth. That is a life-transforming or life-compelling relationship with the person of Jesus. Paul, who wrote the New Testament, basically said, it's the love of God that compels me. And it's through Christ Jesus that we enter into that life and the love of the Trinity, which is where we're called to live for all eternity. I wanted to get to this point so that the next time we can say some so what questions. Uh, so what that Jesus is our authority? So what that uh, Jesus is among us? What does that mean? What does that imply? What does, uh, because if we make that claim, and I will make that claim uh, for me, but not only I believe true that, uh, like what's written in the first chapter of, what's written in Colossians, of who he is, that Jesus is the one who holds the whole world together. He is God among us. He is God that brings us into relationship with the Father. And therefore, Christianity doesn't have some authority. It has all authority. It is the voice of God in the world today. And we need to learn to live in that, in that reality, not only for ourselves, but for our cultures as well. I'm going to kind of get quiet now and come back on reflecting on that, who is the person of Jesus at a later date. And, um, and then I want to post something on change, a little thing that's happened to me, to, and I'll encourage you to join in that uh, simple reflection on uh, something I read. But in the meantime, God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.